I'm uh, I'm a complete Bitcoin newbie, so I apologize if my questions are no silly. No problem, but please. What like are the uh, the most outlandish uh, Bitcoin applications you've seen tonight? You're talking about reinventing the payment gateways and financial infrastructures, but you mentioned that once this inversion has taken place, this opens up new doors to new applications. So some <clears throat> examples. Um, it's very very difficult to see those. Um, because they, they depend on a number of different things. First, you need the infrastructure, but then you also need widespread adoption. So, if you look back at the internet and you look at 1992 and you say what we're going to see in the future, right? I mean, video teleconferencing was obvious. That was part of Star Trek 20 years earlier. They could imagine that. What they couldn't imagine was Wikipedia or Google search or social media. And the reason they couldn't imagine that is because a lot of those things actually require a density of adoption to even be possible. Right? You can't do social media unless almost everyone you know is able to use it, which means they already have internet, preferably mobile internet. You can't do Wikipedia unless there's enough people who can go in there and continuously improve the product. You can't do Google search until there's enough pages that you can do cross-correlation of deep linking. So all of these applications only emerge once you've set down certain prerequisites, and those prerequisites and the applications that come out of them are invisible in the beginning. This happens with every type of new disruptive technology, which is that over the first decade or decades of their development, most of what you see is skeuomorphic design, meaning that it is design that mimics the shadow of the past. So, you go in places like um, New York, and you introduce steel into construction. And what do they use steel to do at first? They use it to build a brick building that looks exactly like all the other brick buildings, only is a bit taller. Right? They don't say, you know, maybe instead of windows this large, we can make the entire facade of the building glass. That doesn't even cross their mind. They spend the next two decades repeating the forms. In fact, one of the most ironic things is that you start seeing with modern construction techniques, um, people put up houses and then they put Roman columns in front. And Roman columns have a very specific purpose. They're there to hold the roof up. They're not decorative elements. <laughs> but you don't need them to hold the roof up anymore, because you have steel beams or bricks or other techniques. So the columns are now purely decorative. They serve no practical purpose. You're just giving kind of a little hat tip to the past. For the, for the first decade in Bitcoin, the vast majority of what you're going to see, and the least interesting things, are going to be, well, here's what we did with banking. Let's take it a bit further. So we're thinking about, ah, let's, you know, retail commerce plus Bitcoin, Bitcoin retail commerce, checking and savings. Let's call destination addresses checking accounts, Bitcoin checking and savings, right? Um, and so this is not innovative. It's skeuomorphic, and we're going to see that happen for decades, uh, possibly. But what's going to start appearing once you lay down the ground to have enough people to do adoption is then you have interesting opportunities. The, the most interesting opportunities for me come from some of the narrow areas where Bitcoin can do things that are not possible today because of its different nature. Here's one that will. I'll just throw a few out there. Okay, so um, every single financial system we have assumes personhood. The the uh, entity that owns and controls money is either a person or an association of people through a corporation. That is it. You cannot have person. Uh, you cannot have money without personhood, because the legal jurisdiction that supports it requires personhood. Well. Elliptic curve digital signatures don't give a damn about personhood, and that is the legal infrastructure on Bitcoin. So you can have ownership and control of money through the ownership and control of elliptic curve digital signatures without a person. That means that software agents and machines can directly own and control money without any human being involved at all. You could create um, an autonomous system of charity that trolls the web, looks for hurricanes, and then if it finds enough, it starts a fundraiser, takes the money, and then distributes it equally to um, charitable organizations, or directly to the people who, through the GPS on their phone, show that they are in the middle of the disaster, and has no board of directors, no owners, no um, corporate structure whatsoever. It's simply an automatic 
money-controlling system. The most wild idea I had is what happens if you take self-driving cars, Uber and Bitcoin, mash them together, and you have the world's first self-owning taxi. Um, a taxi that effectively owns itself. It has paid for its own lease, it's paid for its own maintenance, its own insurance. It collects money from passengers that ride in it, that it provides rides for, and then pays for gas automatically using Bitcoin and pays for its annual maintenance. Now, if you think that could never happen, I've even constructed a scenario of exactly how it would happen. It wouldn't start with autonomy. It would start with an elderly taxi driver who gradually turns themselves into an entrepreneur and owns a fleet of taxis, and then replaces their drivers with autonomous vehicles, and then automates their accounting so that they have to do less and less and less work, and then they die without heirs, and nobody notices. Because the next morning, <laughs> The taxis go out, and they continue doing what they've already been doing. And then you have the first emancipated taxi uh, that suddenly became its own autonomous entity. This is not completely outlandish. Um, there are plenty of examples. Of, um, for example, they found an elderly person in Japan who had died in their apartment 17 years before they found the body, because they had a pension coming in and direct debit of their electricity and utilities, and the air conditioning was turned up enough, and they died in their apartment without airs. Nobody noticed. For 17 years, they just sat there, and the apartment kept being rented, and the rent kept getting paid, and the electricity got paid. And essentially, the apartment emancipated itself. <laughs> but you could do this with a self-driving taxi. There are some really weird things that happen when you remove personhood from the ownership of money. And that's just one example. The other really interesting area is the possibility of doing nano-payments. Nano-payments both in terms of value and in terms of time granularity. With, with certain constructs within Bitcoin called payment channels, or lightning network, and things like that, you can do payments for services, that are billed for a thousandth of a cent in increments of 200 milliseconds or less. So, What could you possibly do with that? I have no idea. I'm sure there are some very smart developers trying to think of something cool now. So again, you lay this infrastructure, everybody has enough liquidity, people have easy access to it, and then you start laying on top applications that were absolutely impossible to do before. And, and that's when we really have an interesting world. So, yeah, that's going to happen over the next 20 years. Okay, let's take uh, maybe two more questions. Yes. Hello. Hey. Um, you mentioned earlier, so um, assuming a widespread adoption of Bitcoin, do you believe that we're going to see, uh, similar like today, different currencies in different regions of the world? Or do you believe that there will be just one Bitcoin, assuming this takes over? Um, do you speak English? Do you speak German also? Yeah. Did you abandon German once you learned English? No. No. But, but no, no, sorry, English I, sorry, is... Sorry, I think is, I was unclear. Do you assume there will be more than one Bitcoin? Yes, well, again, the, to that question, is the, the point is that... You didn't abandon German when you started learning English, and the reason you didn't abandon it is because while English has its uses and may in, in, in some places in the world be the dominant language, that doesn't mean that it exists in exclusion of the other languages. And in fact, you have the ability to use multiple languages. And what you do is you use languages that are appropriate for the context in which you are, and that gives you cultural significance and use within the niche, right? Um, and so. When you think of money as something that is owned by the state and associated with a, f with a flag, like for example, Swiss Air. Right? Remember when all of the airlines had flags on them, and each country only had one airline, and it was the only one that was allowed to land in the main airport? Yes, okay, I'm over 40. <laughs> but I remember it, and that was an absurd idea. Right? So the, when you only had one phone company, it was the national phone company. And it was the only one allowed to install residential telephone lines within the homes of people resident in that country, and the only one allowed to do long-distance calls. That thinking for currency still exists today, and it is an absurd idea, and it creates absurd 
consequences, the idea that for one currency to succeed, the others have to lose, or that there can, there can be within a jurisdiction only one currency. And if you had a currency of every jurisdiction, then eventually it would become the only currency. If you think of instead of currency as a form of language, as a linguistic construct for expressing value, there are languages that work in certain contexts, right? How many of you speak Greek? You're wrong. All of you speak Greek. Have you ever heard of a gastroenterologist, an ophthalmologist, an orthopedic? Right? You speak Greek, because medicine is the context in which we all speak Greek. A bit of Greek. And so we speak Greek. We also all speak Latin. Right? And in some domains, we all speak English because of computers, and in some domains, we speak German, and in some domains, we speak Spanish. The point I'm trying to make is that if you think of money as a language, then the language you use depends on the context in which you're using it and what the other person speaks. And so the money you use will depend on the context in which you're using it and what money the other person accepts. With digital currencies, it's no longer a system where there have to be a certain number of winners and everybody else has to disappear, or where the competition is like that. There are no monopolies. So how many currencies will we have? In the old days, we used to say, how many newspapers does a city have? And you could answer with a simple number and say two or three. And then at some point, blogging happened. Now, how do you think the question, how many bloggers can there be? And can one blogger dominate all of the blogging within a country or a topic or a language? You see, it becomes an absurd question because everyone can be a blogger. And every one of us can be a bank, and every one of us can have a currency. And therefore, the concept of how many will there be, well, all of them, right? thousands, hundreds of thousands, how many of them will be important, tens, hundreds, and will they displace one another, or will one be the universal currency? There will be no universal currency, for the same reason there is no universal language, because there is no universal culture, and there is no universal context, and there is no universal set of needs. So this is a really good question that you're asking, because this is a question that comes up a lot, again and again and again, and it reflects this new way that we have to start thinking about currency, which is completely separate from the way we thought before. Ironically, the idea of national currencies associated with the flag, not only will that end up being something that doesn't exist in the future, uh, but in the end, it will be something that only existed for a very short period of time in history. It's a relatively new invention, <laughs> and it will go away uh, pretty soon. Um, in the United States, for example, Ben Franklin, one of the founders of the country, his job was a commercial printer. His number one product was private currencies. He printed private currencies, because in those days, the idea of one currency across an entire federated nation was nonsense. Turns out they were right. It's nonsense. If you turn a whole economic area into one currency, oh boy, that could go wrong, said the Greek. 